I have the honor of presenting a case that you will see on the screen that was, I was involved in uh, identification of Joseph Mengele in 1985. As you note here, Joseph Mengele was born in 1911 and he died 1979 in February. In his curriculum vitae, this is his own writing, not here on the screen, but he wrote down that he was born March of 1911 and he was the son of a factory owner. He was an engineer called Mengele in Gunsberg on the Danube. He received his PhD degree in anthropology from University of Munich, 1935. And then he received his doctorate degree, med Doctor of Medicine, from the faculty of University of Frankfurt. In 1937, in incidentally, this part of the information it was done by Mary. I certainly appreciate his input here. 1937, he joined the Nazi party. 1938, he joined the SS. And as you see on the screen, he was drafted in the mm -hmm. army in 1940. Because he was wounded in 1942, uh, in 1940, uh, after he uh, wounded then, uh, he was sent to Auschwitz. 1943, he received his promotion to the rank of SS captain, and at that time he was transferred to Auschwitz. In this uh, Auschwitz camp, he worked for some years, and he was one of the doctors over there. There were several of them, but he was the most prominent one in doing his experiments. We don't want to take too much time about his background. I'm sure that most of you know about it and read about it and have seen on television. But he liked to conduct a lot of experiments especially on the twins that they were brought to Auschwitz camp. And it is also known that he was doing these, well, he was not providing any anesthesia or anything doing all these experiments. A lot of them, of course, died and they were sent to to the Auschwitz uh, burning area. And he used to go at the train station over there when they were bringing these people from all over. He was looking for the twins and he was selecting them and sending one of the twins to the laboratory and the other one to the other side and conducting the experiment on one of the twins these were the twins that he was conducting the experiments. And from their appearance, it's obvious that they were not eating properly. They were starving. And one of the experiments that he did, he might have done more, but this is what I heard, that he was using the uh, gypsy children and instead of Siamese twin that usually they separate them, he used to put them together. And I can't understand that they called him Angel of Death. I always thought that the terminology of Angel doesn't belong to a man who was a murderer. But in any event, that was his title over there. And the history, they mentioned that title for him. But he was conducting this type of experiments. You already know my thought about that word. He was a messenger of death, and he was a criminal, and having 
a bad name for physicians. As I mentioned, he used to go to the train station and pick up all these twins. And there was a doctor over there by the name of Dr. Nicholas Neasley. I have his small book here if you want to take a look at it. And he wrote a lot of the experiments that they were doing over there. And uh, he was also conducting the autopsy on those twins. When the so uh, Soviet armies got very close to the Auschwitz area, he decided to flee. He went first to uh, uh, France, and then to Italy, and then from Italy, finally, he went to uh, Argentina. In Argentina, he was uh, living for a while on the side that the well-to-do people were living because he was receiving a lot of money from his uh, families and friends. And it was at that time when the, the poorer section of the town Eichmann was living and Israelis found him and they took him for trial he got the message that he may be found, so he found his way to uh, Paraguay and ultimately to Brazil. He went to a part of Brazil called Sao Paulo, and uh, he spent several years over there with a family called Bossert family. This is the way that they are showing that uh, he left Italy and he went to uh, uh, South America, but actually he didn't go to Sao Paulo first, he went to Argentina first. And all the time he had different names, different identities, and receiving money from his family. That's the way that he survived. Achman didn't have any money, and they caught him and he was put on trial. But he had the money, he could get away. In Sao Paulo, he lived with a family by the name of Bossert, and they knew him. They knew that they were looking after him, but they provided the support for him. And he was there for several years under the, a different name. He had actually the identification of a man by the name of Wolfgang, Wolfgang Gerhard, who was also a Nazi, and uh, the family, the Bossert family, introduced him to him, and he left, actually, Sao Paulo, and he went to uh, Austria, and he gave his ID to, to him, and he was living there for some time under the name of Wolfgang Gerhardt. This picture shows when he was a young man in, uh, in Berlin, and then ultimately, as he changed all the way to the last pictures that you see with mustache, that is his picture in Sao Paulo. They were looking after him, and there was a, uh, a nice sum of money uh, they put up for his uh, capture, a million of Dutch mark, which of course would be a lot of money today, but at that time was also a lot of money. The family of Bossert, after he had an accident at the beach, and he died, they say that he had uh, probably some sort of a attack over there, which I don't know because they didn't perform any autopsy. As a pathologist, I know that I can be only sure if they do an autopsy, they didn't do. And he drowned. After they got some information from the German police and ultimately Sao Paulo police, 
And finally, they talked to the Bossert family, and they indicated that actually he was buried under the name of Wolf and Gerhardt. His body was exhumed. From the pictures that I saw over there, there were, uh, I think, at least 2,000 people, reporters, uh, photographers, everybody was there at the time of exhumation of the body. And uh, these two are Mr. and Mrs. Bossert. They were the one that actually buried him. They knew what kind of a clothing he had at the time of burial. And they were there at the time of exhumation, so they knew what kind of a clothing was there. So they were very much important as far as identity of this body was concerned. This is skeleton. At the time, of course, I was involved with the National Association of Medical Examiner and also American Academy of Forensic Sciences. So my name was given among other specialist to the Department of uh, Justice and I was given the mission to go over there for identification. Now, if somebody knows about Dutch langu language, at the lower part of this indicates that North American Law Levin and Ellis Curley and Israeli Ali Homily went to Sao Paulo. Well, uh, that created a little bit of a problem, of course, for the authorities. I had to go a day later, Low Levin and uh, Ellis Curley, they both went over there one day before I did because I had some work to do here and I had to get the permission from the Secretary of our department and the secretary was very kind to tell me, of course, this is an international case, why don't you go? So I did. I went the next day. And then the newspaper over there wrote this article. And then Sao Paulo, they were anti-Semitic. And they, they were very much concerned about my safety over there. So I remember that the chief of police over there, chief of uh, airport, and also, the, uh, everybody was there in order to protect me. And they assigned two police officers the entire time that I was in Sao Paulo to be with me. In fact, in front of my room when I was sleeping, they were outside so somebody, somebody wouldn't get inside the room. And in fact, when I was eating, they were there and uh, watching me. And that's how we started the whole work over there with my colleagues. I started uh, photographing two folders that they made available to me. These two folders, one was for his involvement with the uh, army, SS army. The other folder was for his marriage, getting married. In order for SS officer to get married, it wasn't such an easy thing. They had to go through a lot of investigation to find out that uh, that person is from a very good family, has no problem whatsoever. And they went through all those things. In fact, I had a couple of those pages here. This is his own folder. This is the folder for his wife. They had to find out his family background, her family background, in order for him to be able to marry this particular woman. And finally, of course, they did. And this is uh, the picture of the woman that he married and pictures together. And happened that they never lived happy ever after. Because right after the, the war was ending, he decided to leave and he left his son and his wife right there and, and he disappeared to South America. These are the pictures that I found in his folder, his military folder from Berlin. And uh, you see a, a front view and also a side view. And uh, we started with the incident in the skeleton. 
was put together in this fashion by the Institute of Forensic Pathology in Sao Paulo. They were very kind, very nice to us, and very helpful. We were three teams. One team by the U.S. Justice Department, myself and Dr. Ellis uh, Curley, anthropologist, and Dr. Lau Levin, who was a forensic uh, odontologist, and another team came from Simon Wiesenthal Center, and again we had uh, a pathologist from that team, an anthropologist, and also Dr. Leslie Lukash, who was also a forensic pathologist, and uh, Leslie uh, was a good friend of mine when uh, we put together the National Association of Medical Examiner and I wanted to have a standard nationally established. He was very helpful. In fact, he was the chairman uh, of that committee that we put the standards nationally for medical examiners. So these two teams, we worked together. And also a team of scientists came from uh, West Germany and they were the one that brought a piece of equipment for superimposition of pictures over the pictures or skull and various uh, bones on the body. We got busy and I started, uh, I'll tell you about that German scientist very shortly, but one of the first things that we want to do was to find out how long, how tall was he? Because U.S. Marshal Service, they were very much interested whether or not this body belongs to Wolfgang Gerhardt because his name was on the, uh, on the grave. And they wanted to, they knew that Wolfgang Gerhardt was buried in, uh, in Europe. And they wanted to fly me over there to do an autopsy. I said, well, just give me his record. So his record, Wolfgang Gerhardt's record, indicate that he was 184 centimeters. And when we checked the femur, and our anthropologist, of course, worked on it, we found out that this body belonged to someone who was 174 centimeters. So that's about 10 centimeters different in length from Wolfgang Gerhardt, so it cannot be Wolfgang Gerhardt for sure. So definitely we ruled out Wolfgang Gerhardt as being the body of this person buried in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And Dr. Elvis Curley, uh, anthropologist on our team, he did uh, a section of the femur, uh, and did some examination and microscopic examination of Haversian canal and determined that the age was somewhere around 70, uh, 64 to 74, so average would be something like uh, 69, 68, 69. And that's how we determine also the approximate age in this case. One thing very interesting here, that the picture that we had from West Germany showed that uh, little opening in his uh, incisors, you will see that space between his uh, upper incisors. And when we took an x-ray of the, let's see whether we have it here, because some of these slides were moved back and forth and uh, I don't have it here, but this is lateral view of him, and we'll get to that a slide a little bit later on. This, the right side is his picture from his uh, German file, and the left side is the picture at the Bossert family home. And they provided that, incidentally, our team went to Bossert family and we interviewed them and trying to find out what they did for him and how he was protected over there. 
He used to go, for instance, to a dentist somewhere outside of the town, 40, 50 miles, 60 miles away, so nobody would determine who he was. He was under a different name. Even to his dentist, he was not Wolfgang Gerhard. There was another name for him. This was his skull that he found. And you noted already uh, that he had some dentures over there. The team that came from Germany, and they were very, very helpful. They came with a piece of equipment that they used to superimpose. We didn't have that piece of equipment. They brought it. And we put together 36 points of identification on the skull. And we wanted to then compare that with his young picture in Germany and his old picture in Bossert home. And that's how that team, the whole team, worked together with this scientist from West Germany. And we were able then to put everything together. You noted the areas that has been marked. And then we tried to see superimpose his pictures, his young picture from Berlin Fall with his, with the body of Gerhard Dash. this man, and we tried to compare every point, and we found out that every point, front view, side view, from top to the bottom, every aspect that we looked, they really matched. You can see from the top, is coming down. Incidentally, you can see the picture on the uh, Front view here, you see the, uh, the incisors, the, the opening. Very interesting that every picture, everything that we had from every view, it matched completely with the skull that we had. And then we picked up the old picture of this man that Bossert gave us, and you see that Again, all those 36 points from the front to the back, from top to the bottom, uh, working with the soft tissue and also with the skull tissue, you will see everything matching completely. See, this is coming from the top going down. And in fact, I think we should have a picture with his hat. Those dots that you see, these are artifacts, has, doesn't belong to him. But even having the hat, we were able to superimpose. The German scientists did all the work here. They superimposed again his picture on the skull, and all the points were matching completely. So we had both the, <clears throat> the young picture and the old picture. They worked very well. And there was no question that this skull belonged to this person. See from the other side, right side, left side, from the top. And one thing I would like to mention that one of his pictures, when he was with Bossert family, he had some gray hair. And we will talk about that a little bit later on when we talk about identification. But I just wanted to show you this picture. This is his old picture shortly before he died. So after we put all these things together, um, we spent about five days over there in Sao Paulo, and uh, my colleagues gave me the mission to sit down and write the report. As a forensic pathologist, of course, we do these things all the time. And uh, so I sat down to do the writing, and I put together a, a preliminary report for identification. Um, at the time that we were doing that, a, a word came from Simon Wiesenthal Center that my colleagues should not sign that because we don't have the final report or final investigation and examination. But since uh, Dr. Leslie Lukash was my good friend, we were working together all 
So finally, I convinced them that, why don't you put your name here too? And then if you don't want later on, we can always take the name off. But we can always start with your name there. So all six of them, we signed that report. The German scientists, by that time, they left. When we were finishing and I was writing the preliminary report. This was still in Sao Paulo. And this is the preliminary report that we wrote. And you see the name of everyone, the six scientists over there to the right. And uh, right after that, we were invited by the council, American council in Sao Paulo. We had dinner in his house. And then the next day, we had a, a big gathering. <coughs> this is the preliminary report that I just <coughs> mentioned a portion of it uh, that uh, in our opinion, uh, this skeleton is that of Joseph Mengele within a reasonable scientific certainty. A more detail will be issued at a later time. Well, then we had this uh, news reporters coming in, a big hall, I think maybe about a thousand people, if not more, we were there. And uh, the uh, American Council asked me to chair that committee. And uh, I asked Dr. Lowell Levin to your left side here. He's a good character, he knew how to talk. And uh, he was explaining to uh, the reporter what we had. I want to mention that it's very important to know by that time we did not have his dentist, we did not have his dental chart from his dentist, nor there was any DNA at that time available. All we were doing with what we had from Bossert, from, uh, from the uh, uh, a skeleton that was exhumed, and also from Berlin. So there wasn't any, but he was explaining the dental findings that we had on at the skeleton. Incidentally, right in the middle of that presentation, I noticed that this 1,000 people, they were gradually leaving the big hall. And I was wondering what was going on. Later on, I found out that they just learned that there was uh, a TWA was done something in New York City. So everybody left the hall. And uh, I, I was, we were left only with a handful of people sitting for the rest of the talk because they found out that this event was more important than what we were talking. Although they spent several days over there listening to us and also for exhibition. But in any event, that's how the whole thing was finished. and. Uh, I'm sure that some of you, if not all of you, know about Jack Anderson. He was a very famous reporter in Washington, and uh, I'm sure that you heard about his name. And he wrote an article that there still could be a hoax. It, it probably was not. Uh, and then somebody wrote another article as saying that <laughs> he was walking around as a, as a female. You know, it was just, uh, in fact, I was presenting this case at our national meeting, and I was invited by many universities. And at that time, I was uh, on the staff of the Jefferson Medical School. I presented this over there. And uh, then I went throughout, I went to Canada, and also uh, throughout the United States, they invited me to go and present this case. And I was in Kansas presenting this case in Kansas City. And uh, I went to my uh, hotel room, and I received a call. And the party introduced himself as reporter Jack Anderson. Incidentally, we were, in, we were asked to go before the, uh, I may get to that, but we went to uh, before Senate Committee, Justice Committee, United States Senate in Washington because Senator D'Amato didn't believe our findings and said that you have to come and explain everything to us. So we went over there and uh, uh, there were some question about our findings and as being positive. And uh, 
finally, I told uh, Senator DeMado and the committee that if somebody find his body alive as Joseph Mengele, I will turn in my license to practice forensic medicine. And so that was recorded over there. So this gentleman, Jack Anderson, called me and said that you have to turn your license. I said, why? He said, because they just found him. Where? They found him in Madrid, Spain. OK, did they stop him? Did they arrest him? What was he doing? Well, he said that he was riding a bicycle. And I said, well, why didn't they arrest him? Because you have to tell, turn your license. I said, I'll be more than happy. Did they arrest him? He said, no. He was riding the bicycle, bicycle, very fast, and the police couldn't get to him. So that's why I still have my license. I did not turn. In any event, uh, I just wanted to let you know about that. Uh, incidentally, those twins that they were not killed, they were one of those that they kept them alive, and then the other ones that they did the experiment and burned them, they formed a group by the name of Candles. And you can see that's the beginning of alphabet on all these names, children of Auschwitz Nazi deadly lab experiment survivors. So their name was Candles. And every time that we went and we were talking about the case, they were over there with placard and saying that he fooled you, and uh, he knew what he was doing. But in any event, uh, I was sure, our team was sure that this was the ban. And as I indicated to you, the Senate wanted me to go over there. We, our team we went over there, and, and uh, that's where I offered my license. And uh, of course, uh, they haven't taken away from me as yet. So after putting all these things together now, and it took a, a lot of time, not only there, but also when I came back, I asked our colleagues to come to Wilmington, to my office here. And in fact, uh, we spent about four or five days here. And uh, the last night, in fact, I invited them to come to our house, which was not finished at the time. And the steel was leaking, and the steel my house is leaking. And, and they came over there, and we had a good gathering together. And uh, while we were here, they were here, we put everything together. And so we had a triangle here. We had the exhumed body, we had Berlin documents, and we had the Brazil old Mangala from Bossert family. So these were the documents that we had, and we had to put these things together in order to come to the final and definitive identification. Let me quickly go through some of these things. <clears throat> there were handwriting, handwritten uh, handwriting uh, experts, and they compared the written document that he had in, in Germany and with the Gerhard Mengele that he wrote with his own hand over there, and they compared them, they matched the old one and the new, the old uh, the Berlin document. We had the file photo from uh, Berlin, and then we had the Bossert photo that, as I said, we compared them, superimposed them, and they matched. Then we had the ID uh, of Gerhard, and he was, he was buried as, as Gerhard, but Gerhard left for uh, Europe, and he was buried there, as I mentioned before, in Austria. And so he was buried there. He was not in, uh, in Sao Paulo. Now, the clothing that they found on him, on his body, when he was buried, was provided by Mrs. Bossert, that I showed you the picture. And she also recognized at the time of exhumation the same clothing that she buried him 
at that burial site. In fact, he wouldn't let the, uh, he would not let the, uh, the person that was burying the body to open the casket or anything. Maybe they recognized that this is not Gerhard because he was being buried under the name of Gerhard. But in any event, she recognized that this was actually the closing that she provided. He indicated to Mrs. Bossert that he wanted to have his arms on his side rather than on his chest. And that's the way that they found the body with his arm on his side. And uh, Mrs. Bossert was the one that actually buried the body and she was there at the time of exhumation. I showed you the picture. So everything matches here from not being Gerhard and being this no good man. Now we found out from examining his skeleton that it was a male skeleton and he was a Caucasian. Both of them the exhumed body and Mengele. In his record, he was 68 years, and I indicated that examining the bone, he was somewhere around 64 to 74. That would be somewhere around 68, 69, 67. Again, I mentioned about the stature. You noted that his own record indicated he was 774, and by testing the, uh, the skeleton, we found out that the lens was 173.5. That would be pretty close. You can't get any closer than that. And then, finally, the head circumference at his Berlin document was 57. And we found out that the time of the skeleton examination was 57.3. Again, very close. He had a number of accidents, motorcycle accidents in his Berlin document, and he had a fall, and uh, he had wartime injuries. Everything was recorded, and the exact type of finding we had at the exhumed remain, the skeleton that we found, fra old fracture of the right innominate bone, and injuries of the right thumb, and uh, his uh, sternocleid Kalinoid uh, bone was also uh, showed the uh, old fracture. We may have a couple of more here. Incidentally, I told you about the incisor teeth on his pictures, front pictures, and you note, of course, the the canal over there, and the uh, in his uh, X-rays shows very clearly. I'm superimposing the two things very clearly that this is the same type of comparison. He indicated in his diaries that he had recently, he had a root canal with the gold veneer. And we found the number three, the gold, the root canal, and the gold veneer on top of that. And he also described his extraction, and we found out exactly the same thing. Our odontologist, Dr. Lowell Levin was very helpful, and also he indicated about his denture, which in his pictures we knew it, and of course in the skeleton, it, this is his uh, uh, root canal with the gold veneer. And these are other dental, and his denture was there. And it wasn't until about eight months later that U.S. Marshall found his dentist was in another city somewhere under a different name. And finally, the dentist looked at his file and looked at their, the file that we put together there at the time of examination of the skeleton, and they matched completely. But that was done about eight months later. Again, some additional things that uh, the photograph that Bossert gave us, and then I told you, I showed you all the superimposition. 
He had a swelling in his right, and he indicated that he's swelling the left face periodically, and we found out that he had and maybe a fistula in his left uh, zygoma. As I indicated, he had gold crown on the left lower, and uh, that matched with our findings. And he had denture in his riding, and then, of course, we had denture at the burial site. Uh, <clears throat> so finally, as I indicated, they found his dentist, and uh, uh, one of the things that was very important that we found that he indicated that November 27, X-ray revealed considerable changes in his L3 and L4. He had arthropathy. And at the time of examination of dead body, we found evidence of changes in his uh, lumbar spine, L2 and L3, L3 and L4. He also indicated that in his diaries, then when he was riding some, sometimes, after a while he started to have pain in his back of his shoulder. And you can't have a better evidence than this. We can all see that fracture over there. No wonder he had pain in his shoulder area every time that he was riding. I mean, so many things of from a body under a different name in a grave, skeletonized, and then the person that they were looking. Again, putting it together in his diaries, L3, L4, and we found arthritis changes in the vertebra. In his handwriting, he indicated that he had pain in his right shoulder area. He had the fracture over there, he just noted. And uh, he indicated that he had root canal that we found out in his L3, I mean his uh, left lower area, he had the root canal and also the, the veneer. Again, skull and uh, photo superimposition. One thing I mentioned about his, his mustache and his hair, we looked at, there were gray hair in his uh, uh, in his exhumed casket, there were some gray hair, and it matched roughly matched the same gray hair that he had in his uh, belonging while he was with Bossert families. And very interesting, his eyebrow hair was in his uh, eyeglass casing, and the same thing was found in his coffin. So you see again so many points of matching here. I told you about diastoma on his picture and his wide incis uh, incisal canal and his dental chart, there was no problem. His pictures and the skull superimposition, everything matching. So finally, this is the opinion with the permission of our scientist, I wrote, and the skeleton is not Wolfgang Gerhard. Probability, this is very important, of two persons, two individuals in the whole world having many specific points of agreement is virtually none. That's what I wrote at that time. And uh, I indicated that this is Joseph Mengele with all reasonable scientific certainty. And of course, I sent a letter on behalf of our uh, fellow scientists to uh, the Honorable Edwin Meese, who was the Secretary of the Attorney General of the United States. and. Uh, I indicated in that letter, which was December 15, 1986, December 15. We did the examination 1985, and this is December 1986, and I indicated that uh, we have arrived at the opinion that the skeleton exhumed at Embu, Brazil, was that of Joseph Mengele. 
and was not Wolfgang Gerhardt. And the name of our fellow scientists are down there, and also the name of the gentleman from a special section of the uh, uh, Attorney General's, U.S. Attorney General's office, and also the, the gentleman who was the chief of the, uh, the police. The uh, newspapers were very kind to me. Uh, I didn't deserve it. All my fellow scientists really did the work. And I just wrote it down. They did the work and I wrote it down. Again, they became very interested uh, to write another article. The, the reason that I'm showing you this is the last paragraph, if you can read it from there, and a portion of that is cut, actually. Right after I came back from Brazil, they called me from mayor's office in Philadelphia that uh, the chairman of the MOVE committee would like to have a, a, a meeting with me. And I didn't know because I didn't know really what was the problem because this happened uh, about two months before they bombed. The only bomb that was dropped from a helicopter or a plane in the United States was the bomb that police in Philadelphia dropped in, in Philadelphia. So in any event, they wanted me and, uh, to go over there and investigate the move bombing which burned that house and 11 bodies they found over there, plus 63 houses were also burned. So I asked the two gentlemen that worked with me, Dr. Lowell Levin and uh, Cur Dr. Curley, uh, to join me and we went, we spent several months back and forth because I had to do my work here. But we spent a lot of weekends over there and we investigated this case. And it was a very interesting case and I found out certain problems with the findings over there. Uh, I'm fortunate that uh, those people died and some misidentification was made regarding the being adult or children. And uh, I was offered that job after I finished my work. Of course, this was my baby here. I didn't want to go over there. I had 17 jobs offered, but I didn't want to go over there. I wanted to stay here to have an independent medical legal investigative office. They didn't like that either. But that's the way that history goes. It was a very interesting case, that case. And you note here, uh, very famous people, the picture is down here, that's Ronald Reagan and then President of the Soviet Union and uh, you know this picture here, uh, the Prince of uh, England. Uh, so it, it was one of the life's hundred uh, pictures and event. And uh, let's see whether we have that, yes. the. Uh, Life Magazine's uh, reporter and photographer came to my office over there. This was my medical examiner's office. And uh, he wanted to take a picture to put it in the, and it was one of the pictures that, that year for the Life Magazine. And uh, so we shared this picture with everyone. And that's how we put the case together. And uh, the dentist was found eight months later and he confirmed that our findings was the same as the one that he had. And uh, the newspaper wrote down, yes, now the x-ray has confirmed. But we confirmed it before. And uh, uh, finally, some seven years later, the DNA was one of the scientists in, Ger in England uh, was put together. And they needed something to make the comparison. The family first refused, the wife and the son refused to give blood sample. And uh, I had a portion of his bone in my office uh, and I took it home. I, I still think, I think I have it at home, a portion of his bone. But they got my bone, the, my piece of bone that I had. and. They told the family that if you don't give the the, your blood sample, we are going to dig the graves of all your 
ancestors, your grandparents, grandmother, this and that, and they were afraid, so they finally gave their sample. And way back at the beginning of DNA development, seven years, eight years later, they came up with the positive finding here, positive identification, because they found out that the same type of DNA and gene that was in this, in that uh, skull that we had was in the sun here. So you can see that the whole case could be put together when all these scientists work together as a big team. So I just show you this as my final slide here, indicating to you that this was a case that nationally was ever, everybody was after it and was a puzzle and something that everybody was looking after this no good man, no good doctor. And this scientific investigation really resolved an international issue. I appreciate your time. And if you have any question, any comment, anything regarding this case that I would like to hear or your colleagues would like to hear that. Yes, sir. And we used to have some microphones here. I don't know whether I'm a little bit hard of hearing. Why yeah, it was not because of Mengele's case, but I just developed some hard of hearing. Why did so many Nazi and Wehrmacht officers go to Argentina after the war? Well, I, I really don't know all the history, but I know that Achman was there. There might have been some others that. Did they find their way in? I just could they buy their way into Argentina? <laughs> Argentina. 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 They buy their way to Argentina. Well, I, I think that particular town, that particular area, there were a lot of people that they were anti-Semitic, and they wanted to keep him. They wanted to protect him. That's why he went. And then, of course, that family was receiving a lot of money from his family member. So he was really protected. And the reason that they put police with me, because they said Israeli Ali Hamali arrived, they just they were very much afraid that somebody may attack me. Because they were anti Semitic. Yes, sir. Did they ever, did they ever find out how um, he got all that money? I mean there could be some sort of trail. I'm sorry? How oh, the, the, oh, he had all of money. He got his, How did he get all the money? Did he he, ever his, family, his family was very well to do. His father was, as I indicated, was an engineer. They had a big farm and industry, and they were just sending some money through some people all the way to South America. It seems like there should be some sort of paper trail. If not. Oh, yes, there was. They found out all those uh, things, yes. Ali, yes, do, sir. do we know how Joseph Mengele died? They put it in the paper and in the document that he was drowned to begin with. And the reason that he was drowned, they indicated in those papers that he had some sort of attack. Now, heart attack or something, or maybe uh, some sort of a cerebral hemorrhage, they indicated all kinds of things. But I don't know. I never, there was no autopsy performed. Right after the burial, this woman, Bosser, just took her to that cemetery and is 60 miles away from San Paulo and buried him. They said he had a stroke, according to Wikipedia, yeah. in the drowned. water and drowned. drowned yeah. There was a lodge. Uh, where, where is the picture of you and Dr. Quincy? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, as I mentioned last <laughs> meeting, uh, we invited Quincy to our national meeting and uh, he was having some, uh, some events in his serials, and he was not very kind to medical examiners. He was talking all kinds of things. So I said, look, I want to tell you something, the, the true work of medical examiners. He said, my brother is my writer. Why don't you get in touch with him and tell him? So I got in touch with his uh, brother and a couple of the 
episodes that they played, there was a little bit more of uh, uh, interesting comment about medical examiners and what they do, rather than what they were doing before. Ali, I have a question. And I had his picture here last time. I think I showed that. Sorry, I, I oh, yes, sir. I wonder who paid for you to go all the way to Brazil and investigate the, in this case? Well, who first paid, of all... Is state paid for it? Or no, no. Special I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mention that. State was kind enough to continue my salary for that week and later on. Mm -hmm. And I'm always very uh, thankful to them because mm -hmm. they thought that this is an international case. We may as well. Uh, State of Delaware was involved. The medical examiner's office here was involved. So they paid my salary. Federal government paid for my trip over there. Okay. So I didn't pay it from my pocket, although my house was uh, still leaking. <laughs> Ali. Yes, sir. I've known you for a number of years through the Medical Society, and there was a, a, the next to the last sentence that we could read on the newspaper article about the move said you were a dapper dresser. <laughs> yeah, I would say you still are. Thanks for all you've done for the medical. This is from when I had money 40 years ago, this was from 40 years ago, so I said I may as well put it on today. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. My pleasure and honor.